hello and a very warm welcome um, to the 18th event in our Street Drugs webinar, webinar series. And so far we've covered a very wide range of topics from nitrous oxide to alcohol, stimulants, spice, drug consumption rooms. And everybody, for your diaries, we've got two events coming up, one on naloxone uh, on the 19th of May. And actually Judith was just showing her intranasal naloxone pack that she ca carries in her back pocket, which is brilliant. Uh, and we have another one coming up on drug trafficking and policing. Um, and that I'm hoping that will be in April, but th that's to be confirmed. So I'm Jo Neal, I'm from the University of Manchester with James Morgan and Chris Chandler uh, of London Met University. We are partners in these events, we've been running them for some time now, and also with Drug Science. And a huge thank you to Mags, who's behind the scenes today, doing all the hard tech work. Yeah, as I said, we'd over 750 people registered. So clearly benzodiazepines are very much on everybody's radar at the moment. This event will be recorded and you'll be able to access it on the Drug Science website and on James Morgan's YouTube channel. So don't worry if your, your friends or your relatives couldn't come now, uh, they'll be able to catch up with it. Uh, we can't stream it live to YouTube today, um, but I'll let you know if that changes and, and we start to do that. So something I, I'd like to ask of you, the audience, please, when you put your questions, and I know you will have many, can you put them in the Q&A section and not in the chat, please? Uh, because we want to put links into the chat, uh, you know, further information. And if you put it in the Q&A, it makes it much easier for me to field the questions and for the speakers can answer them online as well. So you'll get a much, um, you know, better experience of having all your questions answered. It's hard in the chat. It's quite easy to miss questions. Um, so I'm a pharmacologist. And I've always found benzodiazepines quite tricky to understand. Full confession here, the pharmacology is complicated. Um, so today all that's about to change because we have Professor Graham Henderson here who's going to do uh, explain the pharmacology. And you know, even if you're not a pharmacologist, you will love this because they're intriguing molecules. Graham is a professor of pharmacology at the University of Bristol. He is a member of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, the ACMD. They're in the news at the moment, giving um, evidence about nitrous oxide. He's a member of the Scient Scientific Committee of Drug Science, as am I. And his current research interests are about how polypharmacology contributes to opioid overdose deaths. And his team have been studying the influences of alcohol and gabapentinoids, and they're now looking at benzodiazepine opioid interactions. Thank you very much, Graeme. It's great to see you. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, so I'm going to talk about the pharmacology of benzos, and I've entitled this The Geeky Bit. And the reason for this is that uh, recently I was on the Collective Voice um, webinar on benzos and one of the speakers who should have known better described pharmacology as the geeky bit. So I've been a pharmacologist for over 50 years, so I'm an unreconstructed geek, but I hope you'll manage to follow most of it because it's not that complicated really. Uh, I'm just having difficult, all right. So, Benzodiazepines um, work by potentiating the effects of the brain inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA uh, at the GABA A receptor. Now, GABA is very important for us because it's ongoing in our brains. And without GABA, we'd all be convulsing just now. So the reason that you're sitting comfortably is because your GABA is activating the GABA A receptor um, to keep uh, everything damped down a bit. So we'll come back to this receptor later. I just want to start with uh, sort of clearing up what are some common misconceptions. Um, when people talk about GABA, um, they quite often refer to benzodiazepines, uh, the Z drugs like Zopiclone and gabapentinoids. 
and they call them um, the, the GABA drugs. Well, I think this is very misleading because they do not all work on GABA. So the term benzodiazepine is a kind of complicated term, and it actually just relates to the chemical structure of the molecule. So over here, this is a benzodiazepine. And what you can see here is this funny seven-membered ring. Uh, this is very unusual in, in, in drugs. Um, and there is actually a story that uh, when this uh, molecule was first synthesized at Hoffman La Roche, they made a mistake and came up with this. So this is a diazepine ring. And here you've got a benzene ring next. So we've got a benzodiazepine. But it's kind of unusual in pharmacology to talk about drugs just based on their structure. We normally talk about them in relation to what they do, like beta blockers and, and so on. Now, Z drugs are related to benzodiazepines in that they work at the same site, but Z drugs don't have the same structure. So benz, um, Z drugs are not actually, in fact, benzodiazepines. What we say is that they're benzodiazepine-like drugs because they work in the same way. Now, the one that we have to ignore today, or the group that we have to ignore today, are the gabapentinoids. So the gabapentinoids were first designed to be a molecule of GABA with a little bit stuck on the end to help them to get through the, uh, the blood-brain barrier and in, into the brain. Um, and so the people who synthesized these gave them names with GABA in them, like gabapentin and pregabalin. But now we realize that these drugs don't interact with the GABA receptors at all. They've got a completely different mechanism of action. So we have to treat these separately. So they're not benzodiazepine-like drugs at all. And I'm not going to mention them again today unless somebody asks a question about them. So on here, I've just um, extracted some information from um, the uh, government's website about the benzodiazepines that are currently controlled under the Misuse of Drugs Act. And you can, the, the point of showing you this is just to show you how many benzodiazepines there are. In, in blue, I've highlighted the ones that you've probably heard about and the rest of them, uh, they're just um, like benzodiazepines, but we, we're gonna concentrate on, on, on the ones that are in blue. In green, we have the ones that are just arriving in Britain and have recently um, been considered by ACMD. And to clarify some um, perhaps uh, things that might, might confuse, um, alprazolam is known under the trade name of Xanax, diazepam is known under the trade name of Valium, and flunitrazepam is better known as the trade, um, it's a marketed name of Ruhypnol. Um, and um, well, I'll try and talk about alprazolam and diazepam uh, as we go through, uh, but just so that you, you realize I'm talking about Xanax and Valium when I'm mentioning those terms. Right, so benzodiazepines and Z drugs uh, are known to reduce anxiety, to be anticonvulsant, uh, to be sedative and sleep inducing. They improve mood as well as reducing anxiety. They're muscle relaxant and they do induce amnesia and cognitive impairment. So in uh, clinical practice, um, we want to reduce anxiety and we may want to have an anticonvulsant and we may want to have a sedative, but we might not want them all at the same time. So historically what happened is that we chose short acting um, drugs to produce sedation and amnesia. So a drug like midazolam is given intravenously for uh, short uh, procedures um, where you don't really want the person to be given a general anaesthetic and be or rendered unconscious. You just want them to be sedated and, and to forget what happened while they were there. Um, and uh, if any of you have been for an endoscopy, that's probably uh, they gave you midazolam while doing that. For sleep induction, you want people to wake up after a period of sleep and be fresh. You don't want a hangover effect. You don't want to be drowsy during the day. And so we used short acting uh, benzodiazepines or Z drugs, which are also uh, short acting uh, when we want to induce sleep. Um, for anti-anxiety and anti-convulsant 
Um, what you want is a, is a drug that people can take once a day and they'll still get um, the effect all day. And therefore we use long acting benzodiazepines. So when I started lecturing on these drugs many years ago, this was all we talked about and we just left it at that. Uh, but what I'm gonna do today is to show you that it's actually even more complex than this. With prolonged administration of these drugs, you get the development of tolerance, and that seems to be greater with higher doses and higher frequency of dosing and with the longer acting drugs. Um, but the, the effect does wear off with continual use. And you do also get um, the, uh, in, uh, the, the, the development of, of dependence where there's a withdrawal syndrome when people stop uh, taking the drug, especially if they talk, stop taking the drugs acutely. Now, for recreation or street use, um, then people are looking for various um, changes to their, their, their current environment. Um, we know that at low doses, you get relaxation, reduced anxiety, and an, imp an improvement of mood. And I just chosen this quote from Reddit because I quite like it. It says, it makes you sleep, it makes you sleepy and not give a fuck. Not great for socializing, but still good for anxiety, or if you just want to chill out. In addition to people taking low doses, though, there are people that take high doses. And these people are looking for oblivion and amnesia. So there's a spectrum of ways in which people take these drugs and which is their favorite drug, depending on what kind of uh, effect they're actually hoping to have or experience. Right, so the first couple of things I want to do are, are, are just remove some misconceptions. And, and one of them is about the rate of onset of benzodiazepines and um, the, the effect. So what we're relating to here is overdose risk. Um, if you uh, take a tablet, wait a little while, get no effect, then a lot of people just then take a load more. Um, and, and this leads to, 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 to potential overdose and, 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 and unwanted effects. And there is a misconception. I've heard a number of people say that the long duration of action benzodiazepines have slow onset. So I um, extracted this, uh, this uh, table here from, from the web just to show you that if we look at diazepam, diazepam is one of our long acting uh, um, benzodiazepines. It, sits in the body for well over uh, 50 hours, but it is fast onset. Similarly, fluorazepam is very long acting, but is fast onset. So it's not that long duration is uh, related as is slow onset. Um, long duration may though be associated with the fact that the drugs are metabolized into an active metabolite. So diazepam itself, it is probably out of the body after about 20 to 24 hours, but it's metabolized to something else which stays in the body. And that metabolite is also active. So you get a double dose of drug. You get the first drug you took and then you get its metabolite. And that's maybe why it's long acting and still fast onset. Now, uh, we have to consider that people are taking uh, both prescription benzodiazepines and illicit benzodiazepines. Um, benzodiazepines are usually taken as tablets, capsules, or in liquid form. And I just want to discuss tablets uh, in, for the moment. If you take a tablet, any tablet, the first thing that happens is it goes into the stomach where the tablet has to disintegrate and then the smaller particles then give up their drug and the drug goes into solution in the gastric contents and then it can be absorbed either from across the gastric mucosa or pass into the small intestine to be absorbed. Now, pharmaceutical grade tablets, this process here is very well controlled. There are certain regulations about how long the tablet should take to disintegrate and how long it will take for the drug to dissolve. So if you've got a a prescription benzodiazepine and one day it comes from one drug company and the other day it comes from another drug company, you'll get exactly the same kind of rate of the drug coming in 
um, as the tablet disintegrates. However, if you're taking an illicit benzodiazepine, you're taking a tablet that's been made in a pill press in a garage somewhere by somebody who's just been press ganged into making that tablet. And you can have no idea if they've made a good tablet or if they've made a bad tablet. So um, you might one day take a drug and you get a very quick effect. Well, that might be because it just disintegrated very rapidly. The next day, you might take a, a drug from another illicit source and it might be quite well made and then not get an effect. And what we, the harm reduction advice is start low, take it slow. It's not start low, then if there's no effect, just take a handful. That is really kind of a dangerous thing to be doing. So if you're taking a street illicit benzo tablet, uh, what's going, what is it likely to contain today? So this is not really my area of research, but I, I just looked into Wedenos the other day for, and a couple of other sources, for what they'd found were in tablets in, in February this year. And, and what you can see is that when somebody was sold a tablet as a, 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 as a valley, then there was a chance it would contain diazepam, um, but there's also a chance that it might contain any of these other benzodiazepines. Similarly for Xanax, there's been uh, reports of different drugs being in these tablets, etizolam and zopiclone. So with illicit benzodiazepine tablets, you cannot be sure of what you're actually taking. And that may change the effects that you get when you take the drugs. So people ask, um, can you tell different benzos and Z drugs uh, by the taste? Um, well, there are certain facts that we can say. Zopiclone tastes metallic. Everybody agrees on Zopiclone being metallic. Rohypnol is tasteless, and that's why it's used um, to add to people, spike people's drinks um, um, and, and for, for and date rape cases. But for the other benzos, there's a real disagreement about whether or not you can tell them by their taste. Some people say that Xanax tablets are sweet, right? but actually what, what may well be the case is it's not the drug that's giving the taste, but it's the other things that have been put into the tablet, what we call excipients. And so you may take a tablet one day and you think it's a Xanax tablet and you think, well, that's quite sweet. The next one you take from a different source might taste differently because it may have different excipients. So it's quite difficult to rely on the taste of the tablet to know what you're taking. So the bottom line, the uh, drug harm, uh, reducing drug harm message is it's best to get your drugs tested. And so you can always sell, send your drugs to Wedinos, um, or you, if you're at a festival, you can use the loop and hopefully soon we'll have drug testing in, in various cities uh, around Britain too. Now, are the effects of, that we experience when we take a benzo or a Z drug different? Or are they all exactly the same? Well, I wouldn't be suggesting that we talk about this if, if they were all the same. They have a complex pharmacology. And this really is the geeky bit, but I love it. All right. So benzodiazepines and benzo-like drugs are what we call positive allosteric modulators or PAMs at GABA-A receptors. So I'm just going to describe what this actually means. The GABA-A receptor is a group of proteins. It's five proteins in a ring with a hole down the middle. And these sit in the membrane of neurons. And when GABA activates this receptor, all right, the hole in the middle opens and chloride ions go into the cell and that's negative. So it's kind of depressant. And while we have five proteins, we always have two alpha, two beta and one gamma, and it goes round in the same order, gamma, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. So what I've done now is go from this side view to a top down view and represent it more like the petals of a flower. And so here's the hole down the middle that we want to open. And this open opens when two molecules of GABA 
bind, and they bind between the alpha and beta subunit like that. So there's two come in, and that will cause the whole thing to change its shape, and the hole will open. What a benzodiazepine or a Z drug will do is will come in to the space between the alpha and gamma subunits. There's only one space there. And that, by coming in here, the benzodiazepine doesn't itself actually open the hole. What it does is it makes this bit and this bit slightly widen and allow the GABA to come in and bind better. So benzodiazepines modulate the effect of GABA. And because it's in a positive way, we call them positive allosteric modulators or PAMs. Um, just in passing, I just want to highlight that we do actually have a, a drug that will bind here that does nothing. This is flumazenil. Uh, it will bind here, but not affect GABA uh, binding. And therefore, it antagonizes um, other benzodiazepines and Z drugs. So we do have an antagonist uh, that can be used in emergency situations to reverse a benzodiazepine overdose. OK, so this is quite simple and it's quite fun, um, but it wouldn't be pharmacology if we didn't make it a bit more complicated. And the reason it's complicated is that molecular biologists went in and looked at the GABA receptor and they said, OK, there's an alpha subunit. Let's look for these in the, in the genome. And they actually found that there are six different alpha sub, subunits. There are different beta subunits and there are different gamma subunits, but I'm going to ignore them today because it's the alpha subunits that we need to think about. Well, why does this matter? Well, different alpha subunit, subunit containing receptors mediate, mediate different effects because they're expressed in different parts of the brain. So just as an example down here, here's um, a, a GABA-A receptor where we've got an alpha-1 subunit at the benzodiazepine binding site. And this drug represented by uh, this red blob comes in and binds very well. Here, we have another GABA-A receptor, but now we've got an alpha-2 receptor, an alpha-2 subunit, and it's a different shape. So if it's a different shape, then the cleft here is also of a different uh, shape. And, and this drug now well, has difficulty binding here, but the blue drug um, binds very easily. And so this means that in parts of the brain where the receptors have alpha-2 subunits, the blue drug will work better, whereas in parts of the brain where the alpha-1 uh, subunit is present, then this benzodiazepine will work better. <clears throat> so, a whole host of work done 20 or 25 years ago uh, tried to examine what each, what each of the alpha subunits did in relation to the, um, the behavioral responses that they would mediate. So first thing to say is we can discount alpha-4 and alpha-6, because when they are there, benzodiazepines can get into bind, so they're out of the picture. But when you've got an alpha-1 containing uh, receptor, then a drug acting on that receptor will produce sedation and sleep, some anticonvulsant activity, and memory loss. When you've got an alpha-2 containing um, receptor, then a drug which binds here will give you anxiolytic activity, anti-anxiety, and anticonvulsant activity. And when it's an alpha-3 subunit, you get anxiolytic activity, anticonvulsant activity, and, and something that looks like an antidepressant effect as well. And when you have um, an alpha-5 subunit, these are present in parts of the brain where if this um, receptor now is activated, you get mood elevation. Now, the kind of original drugs, things like diazepam and also some of the uh, classic um, uh, drugs that are uh, street drugs, atizolam and bromazolam, they're relatively non-selective. They bind to alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3, and alpha-5 receptors and are good at activating those receptors. So for these drugs, you get the panoply of activity. But you can kind of see that from a pharmaceutical company um, perspective, if you want an, a drug that's going to be given to people to take away their anxiety, you might not want sedation and sleep. You don't want them going around drowsy all the time. Um, 
And so there was a great deal of activity uh, trying to develop selective drugs, drugs that would only activate one or two of these receptors and, and, and not the other one. Similarly, if you want to induce sleep, then you want to have something that's going to activate alpha-1. And so, so what we have is clobazam, which is uh, binds better to alpha-2 than an, an alpha-1, and it's an anticonvulsant with less um, sedation. Zopiclone and other Z drugs are good at alpha-1 and alpha-5, so they're not going to give you much anxiolytic activity, but they're going to give you sedation and, and mood elevation. Most of the pharmaceutical research, though, wasn't terribly successful. Their drugs really um, seemed to just produce most of the effects, and, the, and, and they couldn't really get a drug that would just do one thing and, and not, not the others. But there is one still in clinical trial. It's called Derigabat. It used to be called some telephone number. Um, and it's good at alpha-2 and alpha-3, but not good at alpha-1 and alpha-5. And so it's in clinical trials as an anxiolytic with le less sedative and euphoric activity. <laughs> so to finish then, I just want to talk a little bit about polypharmacology and benzodiazepines. So polypharmacology is when you take multiple drugs of different types at roughly the same time or in, in a sequence when one will still be in the body uh, that you took a bit earlier. And, and the one that we've always considered to be the most dangerous is, is alcohol, which along with uh, uh, benzodiazepines, you get an increased likelihood of overdose, you know, enha enhanced sedation, um, and, uh, and, and really, that, that's a dangerous combination. Now, alcohol, um, it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty dirty drug. It works across a whole range of systems in the brain, including the dopaminergic system, the endorphinergic and the glutamate system, as well as, as GABA. But it does potentiate GABA at some subtypes of GABA-A receptors. And there is a spot on the receptor where we think alcohol will bind. It's not the same place as the benzodiazepines. And it's been postulated that um, the relaxing and sociability promoting effects of alcohol may be due to enhancement of GABA activity in the brain. So one of the um, uh, positives that's come out of this is that maybe you could develop uh, a drug um, that goes for the alpha-6 GABA-A receptor, um, uh, GABA-A receptors. Um, and that could be a positive substitute for alcohol. Um, and GABA labs are currently developing alcohol for this, this purpose. Whether or not the government would allow it to be uh, distributed legally is a totally different question that we'll have to come to at a later date if this is indeed successful. The other aspect of polypharmacology, and it's the one that's closest to my heart at the moment, is our, our, the interaction between benzodiazepines and opioids. Um, and this really comes from a, pro a very significant problem in Scotland, but it's still a problem in, in, in England and Wales as well. So what we have in this graph is uh, from 2009 to 2020, the number of drug deaths involving benzodiazepines. And you can see that in England and Wales, it's risen from about 261 to 476, so about a doubling. Over the same period in Scotland, there's been a dramatic increase in deaths. So in 2020, it was 983 deaths involved a benzodiazepine. Now, when you look at these graphs, you think, well, that's just twice. But what you have to consider is that the, the population of England and Wales is 10 times that in Scotland. So if everybody in England and Wales was suffering just the way that they are in Scotland from benzodiazepine overdose, uh, this number should be uh, 10 times higher up here. So there's a problem in Scotland. Um, so that has meant that people have actually looked into what's happening in Scotland. And uh, up until quite recently, the major benzodiazepine that's been available illicitly in Scotland has been etizolam. And so you can see that over 800 deaths involved etizolam, uh, whereas in, in England and Wales, it's diazepam and temazepam. So there are a whole host of, of possible reasons 
for why a tizalam uh, is uh, makes. Uh, oh, sorry. The other thing is that in 2020, over 90% of the deaths involving um, benzodiazepines in Scotland, there was also an opioid present. So there's something about the combination of etizolam and other benzodiazepines and opioids that, that make it a deadly combination. And it doesn't seem to be dependent on which opioid. You can, so it's about a 50-50 split between heroin and, and methadone in opioids. Now, I'm not going to talk about what we're doing on that, but I just want to highlight that uh, Katrina Matheson in Scotland um, has published a series of blogs on the risks of benzodiazepine overdose, uh, especially in combination with opioids, and what might be done to mitigate those risks. And uh, she and her colleagues have written uh, a series of blogs, and they're available uh, at this website here. Okay. Thank you very much. Graham, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Do you know what, Graham? I am no longer confused about benzos and their pharmacology. Why did I not have you lecturing to me all those years ago? <laughs> Life's so unfair. But great, folks. And um, I hope you really um, enjoyed that overview because this is, they are complicated um, pharmacological beasts. And that was just brilliant, putting them into perspective and um, explaining them in a way we can all understand. So Graham, I do have a few questions for you. A couple I think you, you'll probably want to answer, um, you know, type the answer, but a couple of people have raised the good point about um, flumazenil being an antagonist. Um, it's like naloxone. So could we prepare that and give it to, you know, to us all to carry around? Oh uh, yes, this is, this is a bit, I hate it when people say that's a good question because it's quite patronizing to the questioner, but this is a good question. Um, the problem with flumazenil has been that in a subpopulation of people that, to whom it's administered, they, they go into convulsions. And so that's been like this warning flag above flumazenil. Um, and then, you know, so um, if, uh, if Judith is walking down the street and she's got her flumazenil, and she gives it into somebody to stop them overdosing, what's she gonna do if they start to convulse? Now, some people like our, our patron, David Nutt, uh, he would say that actually you don't get very many convulsions and the benefits outweigh the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. um, flumazenil is available in the emergency room where they can give it under controlled conditions, um, but there is this problem that, that, that about convulsions. Um, that's really interesting. So actually what we need to develop is a flu mazanil that doesn't do that. Mm. But because the benzos are anticonvulsant, you know, that is a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah. That's really, really interesting. And that, yeah, I agree. That is a brilliant question, actually. Um, right. And I think actually there's a really good question on etizolam, because we've all heard a lot about that. Why etizolam? I, I'm wondering if it's easier to produce, um, but is it more potent than alprazolam? Well, this maybe not be the answer to the question, but it's the answer that I want to give. Um, it, why it is alam in Scotland and not in other parts of the United Kingdom? Right? Um, we're doing some interviews around Britain at the, at the moment, and and in Teesside it's Sopiclone, and in in oh. Bristol it's Diazepam and maybe a bit of Xanax. Um, so I've asked various people, I even contacted the National Crime Agency's bosses uh, to ask them if they could say why this is the case. And nobody's got an answer. Uh, mm. It's probably because some of the drug dealers in Scotland found a supply of etizolam and they pushed it. Why that's not, it does filter down a little bit um, to England and, and Wales. It's not that we don't have any, but it's not, it's not flooded down here. Um, and it's a really interesting thing to, uh, to find out, um, but I don't have an answer. No. Um, and then why Zopiclone in, um, in Teesside? Um, are GPs, maybe Judith can re respond, are GPs in Teesside feeling that Zopiclone's less dangerous and prescribing it? I don't know. Do you know, Judith? It, it will be possible to find out by by looking at the prescription, the data which is accessible, but um, I don't know. 
uh, is the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot, a lot more. Right, so Graham, we have a question about tolerance and dependence. Yeah. A couple of questions about that. Um, just kind of, yeah, how long does tolerance take? Of course, that will be individual, won't it? Um, but just kind of, yeah, how that, that kind of works. The okay, so one of the mechanisms by which you get tolerance is that because the receptor is constantly activated, the neurons think, so this, I want out of here. And so they, they inactivate the receptors. And to do that, you'll get more tolerance the, the, the more receptors you've activated and the longer you've activated them for. So if you've got a long-acting benzodiazepine and you're taking it at large doses and you're taking it very frequently, then you should get more tolerance. The other complicating factor is that some people have suggested that different subunit containing receptors desensitize at different rates. So you might get more tolerance to the sedation rather than the anticonvulsant activity or vice versa. Um, but that's a kind of murky literature. I did look at it for this mm. talk and decided I was going to keep out of it because yeah. it's just, it, it, there's not a, and there's not a good answer for that no. yet. No, it is a really, yeah, another thing that I struggled with as well, actually. Um, uh, okay, people are asking, well, the slide, would you be willing to share your slides? Oh, of course. As long as people don't take them as gospel truth. <laughs> Some of them are a little bit kind of, you know, the alpha one, alpha two, which responses you get. It's, it's more complicated than I put on the slide. And this is just so that I could get a message over. So actually, there's a nice, um, nice question about the interaction between benzos and gabapentinoids. Hmm. Will they be as dangerous as alcohol and opiates with benzos? Well, I've no idea. All right. Um, gabapentinoids don't work on... Um, the, the GABA A receptor. So there's no obvious interaction there. They've got a completely different and, and um, uh, mechanism of action. So um, I would, I think, for any drugs that are sedative, you can get additivity. So there will that you know, that would just be an additive interaction. Whether or not you would get any synergy, that is, that the effects bigger than the two individually, uh, I just don't know. Mm. Um, but it's obviously something that we should be moving forward to mm. researching. And isn't it a, what we really need is an anxiolytic without sedation. And I'm interested in Dari, Darigabat. Yeah. Um, how far on is that? Well, it started off at Pfizer mm -hmm. and then they closed down their CNS research because brain diseases are too difficult for, to develop drugs. Um, and, and then it went to another company. They sold it to, and then they've sold it to another company. And, and now it's with the final company. Um, so you kind of wonder, is it ever going to get there? Um, but uh, there is a hope. It's, it's, I think it's been through phase two. Okay. Uh, yeah. So That's quite uh, promising. Uh, people might know it by, it used to, it's had two numbers, you know, when drugs are mm. you know, known by telephone numbers before they're, they're given names. It's actually had two names and now, now it's called the Rigabat. So there is quite a long literature on it yeah. if you search yeah. through. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I know, Various pharma companies have been working on this for years and yeah. years. I mean, it's the obvious drug to develop, isn't it? But nothing really has come yeah. to me. Has it? And most of that stuff was done about 20 years ago. Yeah. And all the tools for working out the different receptors, sub, the, the alpha subtype things, they've all been put in a deep freeze somewhere. Yeah. So for the new drugs that we have, um, we don't have a lot of information about what subtypes they work on. Yeah. Um, but it's just, yeah. Who's going to fund research to find out what flubramazolam works on anymore? You know? I know. Has to be a big collective. Okay, well, folks, I think we should crack on. Graham, there are a number of questions that I couldn't get to. I don't know if you'd have time to do, type a few answers. Um, but keep your questions coming, folks. They're great. And clearly, we've all got massive interest in this. Um, but I'm going to crack on to the Benzodiazepine Research Project now. Um, and introduce you to our two speakers. And hopefully some of you were at their launch event. I was, it was brilliant. Um, so first of all, Joanna Bright, she is a PhD student. She's a research assistant at the Social, Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Center at King's. 
And she is, of course, was very much involved with the Benzo Research Project and was doing that since 2021, the end of uh, October. Uh, but she's, for the past year, she's been co-leading the research team within the project. And the findings are just so, so interesting. And of course, she's been working alongside that with AJ, um, who is a master's student in the Department of Chemistry. He's also works for SSDP or with SSDP, the um, pretty great organization, um, Students for Sensible Drug Policy. So he chairs that at Imperial. He's also been working with the Benzo Research Project since July 2021, co-leading the research team alongside Joanna. So these are um, volunteer. There's a lot of work being done on a volunteer position here. It's it's really, really impressive. Um, so AJ's mum, Tracy, and Joanna Bright's mum, Karen, they're both here in the audience. So I just think that's fantastic. It must be so so you must be so proud to see um, your your children doing such brilliant, brilliant work and uh, talking in front of so many people. Um, so brilliant. And um, I've known Karen for a long, long time. So um, hello, Karen. OK, so um, off you go. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, so um, me and Joanna are the co-heads of research at the Benzo Research Project. And today we wanted to share an overview of our project, some of the key findings from our qualitative research into the lived experiences of young people across the UK who use benzos, and also some key takeaways from the FOI campaign that we carried out. So yeah, so just a bit of background on who we are. Um, the Benzo Research Project is a group of volunteer students. Um, I think across the scope of the project, we've had about 50 volunteers. And we've all sort of seen within our peer groups and also the sort of drug death stats that benzo use and um, the harms from that is a real problem. And we just wanted to highlight that. And we also saw that in the literature that we had seen, which was limited, young people's voices weren't um, weren't platformed and we think this was really important so that's kind of the motivations behind why we got set up um our website is here this is a bit of a um, screenshot from that i think we're going to try and share links in the chat so you can see what we're talking about going through but we'll also email it um after the talk so to outline the aims of our project firstly uh, we wanted to understand and investigate the motivations of young people who use benzos recreationally and do this in order to produce more targeted recommendations for drug education and support services. Secondly, we wanted to connect with NGOs and charities by forming formal partnerships, which we then hosted regular meetings with, as well as the cross-sector policy event, which we held at King's College in December. Third, we wanted to increase media coverage of benzo use among young people and do so in a non-punitive light to start to change the public perception of drug use. And finally, we aim to create and distribute harm reduction information to young people across the UK. And we did this mainly through Instagram to make this information more accessible. So AJ and I are mainly going to talk about um, the output from the research team and also the FOI campaign that we've run. But we just wanted to highlight that the um, Benzo project is wider than that. We have some other working groups, such as the outreach team, who are integral to us reaching out to people who've supported us throughout this um, project and shared our information once we had our report out. So they've reached out to over 700 organizations. And this helped us um, make some of our seven key partnerships who have been really supportive throughout. The social media team, um, as AJ mentioned, was mainly through Instagram, and they um, were key in sort of sharing the harm reduction and materials that we created and also um, gaining testimonies um, for our well our, for us platform that we're going to explain a bit more about later. And finally, we have um, written four blogs throughout the project. These are all published by VaultVas um, called the Benzo Blogs. I think we should have a link for that and um, we can share with you to read about them more later. So before we go into our findings, I just wanted to shout out and say thank you to the whole of the research team, our founder Monica, as well as Marie, Julie and Emily. 
without these incredible women, we couldn't have done this. So yeah, as I alluded to, um, we set up a story sharing platform um, in partnership with Drugs and Me. It was hosted on their website. And this was basically to allow young people to share their experiences with benzos in an anonymous way um, and to be able to read other people's stories to sort of feel a sense of community and that other people are going through something similar. We tried to highlight um, that we wanted people's stories between the age of 18 to 25, so we could really hone in on that sort of youth experience, although it was anonymous, so we can't like confirm that that was exactly the case. Um, we asked for some basic demographics such as gender and the region that they were in. And we also asked if they uh, for permissions to share on social media to use in our research um, so that they didn't they could tailor what they wanted their stories to be used for. Um, yeah, all stories were anonymous and they were checked before they were put online to make sure there was no identifying information. And then once we started collecting testimonies, the research team really started to focus on doing a qualitative analysis of these testimonies. We got around 74 testimonies at the time of freezing for data analysis. I think there's now around 82, and I would really implore you to go and read them because they're incredibly insightful and a lot are really moving. Um, again, we'll share a link for that. And methodology, I'm not going to go into um, depth on, but there's more information in our report. Um, it's basically a type of qualitative thematic analysis called iterative categorization by Joanne Neal, not to be um, mistaken with the host of our talk today. But um, yeah, that's what we use, and there's more information in the citation here. So from the optional demographics data that we collected, we found that we did get testimonies from across the UK, but the majority of them were concentrated in England, more so in the South. Um, and additionally, just over two thirds of testimonies submitted were from people identifying as men um, with no submissions identifying themselves as women. And we don't have time to go into depth about why we think this might be the case right now, um, but we do discuss this in the limitations section of our report, and we're both happy to take questions on this in the Q&A. So if we highlight some of our findings, um, we're going to talk about benzos throughout, but um, just want to highlight that many, as Graham mentioned, there were many different types of benzos. Um, most people were mentioning things like Xanax and Valium and Atizolam. Um, but we'll just refer to it as benzos for ease of presentation. Um, and one of the key things that jumped out at us first was that most people started using benzos during adolescence. Obviously, this is a young sample, um, but a lot of people were talking about starting at the ages of 16 to 18. So that's sort of like further education, sixth form age, although there were a fair amount talking about taking them before the age of 16, so in high school, and then more uh, some others in university age 18 plus and there's a real pattern of people being given them at parties or um, with friends and sort of social experiences while they were experimenting with drugs and then um, going on to starting to take them on their own um, sort of more of a pattern of dependence um, as this person from Milton Keynes describes it would start with weekends after school then it progressed to weekdays and then even progressed to myself using whilst in college and school. And so we think this really highlights that secondary schools are an important target for harm reductive benzo education so that we can try and get ahead of um, people's first experiences with benzos with some information about how to do that safely. And when we started looking at the motivations for benzo use, it kind of fell into two main categories. Firstly, it was the recreational and relaxation. So replacing other recreational drugs like alcohol and cannabis. Um, again, people taking them at parties or at home watching TV or relaxing before bed. And it was highlighted a few times that benzos were really cheap and quite easy to access. This man in Brighton said, I was initially attracted to benzos owing to how cheap they were. And when taken with alcohol, how they could have a very strong effect for such a low cost. And we think this is important to highlight, um, especially as we're in a cost of living crisis, young people are still looking for that same level of intoxication, but in a way that they can afford. Um, but this can often mean dangerous mixings of drugs. 
And then the second category of motivations was self-medication. Um, and this graph here shows the different kinds of mental health and neurodivergent conditions that were mentioned in relation to taking benzos and then the number of testimonies who mentioned that. And by far the greatest um, reason was for anxiety, which really mirrors the sort of prescribed use that Graham mentioned before, um, also insomnia. Um, and we think that this maybe suggests that there's a quite a large unmet need for youth mental health support, that they're trying to fill that gap where they maybe can't get support through illicit means, they're taking drugs which maybe can help. And as Joanna said, where benzos were often used in party or nightlife situations, polydrug use was also common. And half of all testimonies mentioned using benzos alongside other substances. And what's particularly of note here is that many of those people were unaware of the potentially increased risk associated with these combinations. For example, a man in London said, I had no idea how lethal a combination of Valium and alcohol could be. As you can see in the chart on the right, alcohol was the most commonly used drug in combination with benzos. And so it seems that this lack of awareness is fairly widespread. When we break down these drugs into their drug classes, so how these drugs function and their effects, uh, they fall into two main functions. Firstly, alcohol, cannabis, and opioids fell into an additive or synergistic function, like Brian mentioned before. And what this means is when benzos were taken alongside these drugs, they would increase the intoxication. And with an increase in intoxication came an increase in blackouts, a loss of coordination and balance, and an increase in risk-taking behavior. And so this function seemed to be the more risky of the two, with several instances of overdose happening with benzos combined with alcohol or opioids. In contrast, we have stimulants and psychedelics. And when benzos were used with these drugs, it was used to counteract their effects, often towards the end of the drug experience. So for example, people would go to the club or a party and take stimulants such as cocaine or MDMA. And then when they returned home, would consume a benzo such as diazepam to reduce their heart rate, replenish their appetite and allow them to sleep. And while this function seemed to be the less risky of the two, there are two important instances to note. Firstly, uh, one person mentioned consuming more LSD than they had intended due to benzo induced disinhibition. And this did lead to a bad trip. Additionally, one testimony mentioned that they had a peer pass away, sadly, from a benzo and stimulant overdose. And so we think it's important that in hospitals, benzo consumption is considered during overdose cases, particularly with stimulant overdoses, where current NICE guidelines suggest using diazepam or other benzos to reduce the effects of a stimulant overdose. So a key theme that came out when people were talking about their experiences while on benzos was that benzo induced changes in mood and behaviors significantly impacted their daily life. And this could be sort of in the instance of like a heavy night when they've taken a lot of benzos and really started acting differently to more across time, as especially in cases of dependence where people felt like they completely changed as a person. So this person from South London said, you have no care for friends or family and can feel no passion for things that you love. And then I think this quote from someone in Brighton really encapsulates all of the different themes we picked up in this um, area about risk-taking behaviors and blackouts. Um, they said, I had no capacity for rational or critical thought. I was burning through all my money without a care. I was putting myself in increasingly dangerous situations and I was blacking out severely most days. It's mortifying to think back on. I think it's important to highlight then about 41% of our testimonies, we had people mentioning that they were blacking out, so like, yeah, that they had experienced blackouts. And many people discussed doing risky things like shoplifting or um, risky sexual behaviors. And I think this final quote about it being mortifying is something that was echoed throughout um, that a lot of people look back on their experiences and just didn't recognize themselves and felt a lot of shame about the ways that they'd behaved. 
And unfortunately, we found that among young people, there was a severe lack of awareness and education regarding benzos and addiction. This encompassed a lacking basic understanding of what benzos are. With one, we had one submission uh, exclusively talking about pregabalin, which, as Graham said, is not a benzodiazepine. Um, this also included a lacking awareness of the potential harms related to benzo use. And many people were unaware of the warning signs to look out for when uh, addiction might be developing and where to seek help when they spotted these signs. And drug education um, is really important. And this is highlighted here by a man in Bristol that said, I eventually went cold turkey and didn't taper off, which resulted in a seizure. If I was educated on drugs, I wouldn't have had a seizure. And this really highlights how vital a harm reduction focused drug education curriculum is for young people. Such a curriculum would empower young people to make informed decisions about their drug use and prevent potentially life threatening overdose or withdrawal effects. So if we look at it on the other side, so the support services um, that young people might go to once they realise they're struggling with benzo use, we saw that support is severely lacking um, and that education in these services is also lacking. So um, this was really highlighted here by a man from Belfast who was told that the only option for his um, benzo dependence was to continue buying on the black market so that he could tape off by himself or detox in hospital for two weeks. I think knowing that being on a high dose of benzos and being dependent on that detoxing within two weeks just isn't safe it could easily be a fatal um, experience and also a lot of people trying to taper off themselves um, and going too quickly then experience seizures so this wasn't really a valid suggestion so we really urge gps to familiarize themselves with the risk of benzo withdrawals and how to implement proper tapering procedures. And the Ashton Manual is something that came up during these testimonies and also in conversations we've had since with drug um, support services. And um, we think that this could be something shared with GPs for them to know more. Promisingly, despite the lack of education and support to young people, Several of our testimonies found ways to reduce the harms to themselves related to benzo use. Mainly, limiting dosage and frequency of benzo use was protective against dependence. For example, someone in London said, I never experienced tolerance or withdrawal. I always stopped after I realized it had been two weeks because I was always well aware of the potential risks of dependence beyond that time frame." This is a clear example of where a young person has been empowered by evidence based drug education and has used that to make an informed decision about their use, which prevented them developing dependence. Another key harm reduction strategy among all drugs, as well as benzos, as Graham said, was a start low and go slow approach, but with a illicit unregulated supply as a man from London put it, you never know how much of the drug is in each pill or even which part of the pill it's concentrated in. Additionally, you don't know if it's even the right benzo that they told you it was, as we had people mentioning being sold what looked like diazepam, including a braille labeled box with a safety label, which actually turned out to be a tisalam. And so Probably one of the most effective harm reduction strategies would be to implement a regulated licit supply. So we're just now going to highlight some of the work done by the Freedom of Information team um, who have been using freedom of information requests to the NHS and the um, council services to try and ground some of our findings in external data, particularly um, around services and support available for young people. Um, and me and AJ haven't actually worked on this. We're presenting on behalf of the team. So that's Adele, Sophia, Naz, Hayden, and May. And this was a really mammoth task. So we just want to um, shout out them for this. So the FOI team sent over 300 requests um, to the NHS and councils 
and they've received over a thousand responses um, as it stands, which compile local government and healthcare approaches to benzo use, support and education. And they've put this database of responses on our website so anyone can access that um, if they want to uh, have a look. And looking at NHS requests, um, they sent in an FOI request asking about hospitalizations, mental health admissions, self referrals, and GP referrals around benzo um, diazepine use. And um, we asked for these to be broken down by trust, gender, and ethnicity. Um, the responses that we got back demonstrate that women have a higher usage than our testimonies initially suggest, which we expected, but is good to see. Um, there was a real difficulty in navigating the classification systems of benzos, which makes it hard to get a real picture of how um, people trying to access services for benzo use, um, whether those actually are benzo use or if it's classified alongside other drugs. But it does show that benzo use is a UK wide problem. We also sent requests to councils asking for the number of young people in each council, both accessing and waiting for drug support services. We also asked about drug education schemes and resources and review reviews on performance and staff training for both drug education and support services. However, from the 60 responses we received, they demonstrate a lack of a universal approach to drug education and support in the UK, particularly regarding benzos. Promisingly, we did see that in some councils, a harm reduction focused curriculum was beginning to be implemented, particularly in places like Derbyshire, thanks to Change Grow Live. Um, and benzos seem to be starting to make a larger appearance in these curricula. So it is changing, but slowly. And so, um, as mentioned at the start, we are a student group um, and we've all been doing this alongside our studies, um, many of the group are in final year. Um, and we always aim for this project to have an end, as, as hard as that has been. So we're kind of at the stage now of passing the baton. We're taking the research that we've found and the um, themes that we've picked up on and we really want to take this forward by speaking to people who may have more power in the field to make the changes that we want to see. So these kind of fall into categories similar to the aims that we started on. So we want to reform drug education and support services to have more evidence-based harm reduction information, particularly in this case for benzos. Um, and some of the people we've been talking to here, Cranston, Change, Grow, Live and Crew, um, have been sharing this with us. Um, Again, we want to change the public perception of drug use and we've been in talks with Sky News, we've been um, had a piece done with ITV and also Voltfast um, with our blogs. And finally, we're really supportive of the development of new harm reduction tools and one we're really excited about is um, Sojourns, developed by Drugs and Me founder and the co which helps users track their drug use and um, experiences while on drugs so they can feel more in control of um, decisions they're making about drug, their drug taking. So if there's anyone in the audience that thinks they could help us with our mission um, and would like to take some of what we've learned and take that forward, um, please do get in touch. We would love to speak to you. Yeah. Thank you for listening and this is our email if you want to get in touch and we will hopefully share any links um with you somehow so there's yeah you can reference that later fantastic thank you both so much um for this overview i'm from the questions i'm thinking there are quite a few people in the audience who will be keen to get involved um so i'm hoping that they will contact you um some really interesting finds today um somebody's asking which answer is yes, but would you recommend early intervention at schools in key stage three or four um, on awareness and harm reduction? Yes. Yeah, I think there is definitely a, it's a difficult line to tread where you don't want to be perceived as encouraging drug use. Um, but we know there is a mountain of evidence that shows that just telling them that the drugs are dangerous and they shouldn't do them uh, leads to worse outcomes um, and harms. 
and kind of leads to a you know, effort I'll just you know if you're gonna take it then you're gonna do it completely versus if they're informed about how to take them safely then they can make those you know informed decisions and sorry Joanna oh, I was just gonna say we see like in our testimonies people are starting them in high school so if they know what that what this drug is some people talked about being passed like a blue pill at a party and they just took it they didn't know what it was or they thought it might help them with their anxiety but like don't really know anything other than that it's just like a nice thing to do um if they knew what that blue pill was because someone a few years earlier had said this is what it is um at least they have that information i guess yeah yeah, yeah. The drugs education is absolutely essential mm -hmm. and key stage three four seems like a good time to do it to me um Somebody says purple lean is common in children in 14. I don't know what purple lean is. <laughs> yeah, so we did actually get a mention of that in our uh, testimonies where someone was taking purple lean, which is uh, codeine sort of cough, cough syrup um, that's mm -hmm. commonly used, but uh, mentioned by rappers in the US. Um, and they sort of spoke about uh, taking that with benzos sort of emulating this uh, particular rap culture um, and yeah so it is specific to we found certain music genres mumble rap uh, sort of online focused uh, uh, on a platform called SoundCloud these rappers uh, talk a lot about their benzo use and um, their struggles with anxiety and stuff and so it creates a sense of community I think where they feel they're a part of something. I guess going back to the last question if if young people can access that music at any age so they're hearing that younger than yeah however so we should be like yeah. counteracting that with some more harm reduction information. Absolutely and education and did you get a sense that in the pandemic maybe because anxiety um you know, um, has increased, hasn't it, especially among uh, school kids not able to go to school, not able to socialise. Did you get a sense that the use of benzos was increasing around that time? I think it's hard to say with our data because it's um, it's qualitative and it's people's stories and they weren't talking really about, like, it wasn't we weren't given dates of when they were talking about, but we did see some people talking about their first experiences being with benzos during lockdown because they were just so bored. Um, or like it just killed the time basically. They were sat at home watching TV. Why not also not be thinking about how long you've been sat watching the TV? Um, I, I'm sure there are probably are more stats out there to back that up, but I think from our testimonies, it was definitely a time when people, yeah, we're really bored and this is one way to kill that boredom <laughs> yeah 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 and then anxiety being so yeah so great in that time uh somebody's asking about how m the quantities of benzo pills people are taking at any one time did you get any info on that it was really hard to um get a full picture of uh people's use because it was where we had our um, anonymous online uh, story sharing platform, we couldn't do follow ups um, and get into the nitty gritty about some of the more ambiguous answers. And so it's hard to say, but we did see a, a massive range from um, the, the sort of doses you'd see in the clinic um, and used infrequently, you know, maybe once a month, once every two months, all the way up to 10 plus times the uh, prescribed doses being taken multiple times a day. So there was a really a full range of use patterns. And it kind of maps onto that sort of like two reasons for taking it. You've got the self-medication. And I think a lot of the testimonies that talked about that kind of did talk about more like dosage and like knew what they were taking for what purpose and stuff. Whereas you had the recreational and people will be talking about just like, buying hundreds off the dark web and then splitting them with their friends and then waking up in the morning and they were all gone so they must have taken them but they had no recollection um so yeah i think there's like two categories of ways people are taking them and we saw all of them <laughs> yeah 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 really interesting right there are a couple of people in the q a that you'll be able to see want to get in touch 
Mm -hmm. um, so maybe after this, you'll be able to just um, put your email in again or something. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if we can actually post in the chat, but um, if uh, we can uh, post to panelists. But if um, whoever's in charge of the chat can send it, we're sending it. To I you. think. Can you do the Q and A? I think Graham yeah, was in the chat. Yeah. So these are in the Q and A. Okay. Um, Senior Policy Officer Collective Voice would love a chat, and that's a way of getting. I'm thinking um, your policy suggestions. Yeah, we were um, guidelines, stimulant, um, you know, overdose and so on. I think that's that's hugely important, um, you know, to get these to change policy, actually, and, and yeah. guidelines. Um, fantastic. Um, now, there's an, a question here uh, about the participants being male and in the south of England. Would you um, would you be planning to to try sort of to focus your research elsewhere for the follow up projects, I, I suppose, in different bits of the UK and maybe trying to target women, although clearly it looked to me people didn't want to identify as women, but you did find quite a lot of, of use in, in women. Yeah, I guess we can speculate that, that we did have people posting that chose not to identify their gender and we can speculate that maybe some of those were women and that I guess is quite an interesting question of is there more stigma around being a woman and taking drugs and so I you all want to be more anonymous than maybe men I also wonder if it's I mean the in the part of England I think quite clearly maps onto the team um and we have people going up and putting posters in bars and speaking to people so I think maybe that maps on like our recruitment tactics although the social media I think um it met a broad range of people across the UK um, I think we would love to see this targeting a more representative sample. I think that might be out of the scope of what we can do. Um, but yeah, we definitely don't think that the sample that we got is representative of all experiences. Mm -hmm. um, brilliant. Absolutely. And there are lots of people saying how much they've enjoyed it and what brilliant work it is. Uh, you can mm -hmm. see that in the Q&A. And I just want to say that Graham in the last 40 minutes has been doing a Herculean job answering loads of questions in the chat or in the Q&A, sorry. So thank you so much, um, Graham. Um, it's a, there's a lot of questions, so it is a really big job. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, amazing. Right, well, we should probably crack on now. Oh, yeah, just to say that Joanna's put her, you know, put your email in the chat, haven't you? So the yeah. guys who want to get in touch, there she is. Um, so let's crack on and um, Hear from Judith Yates now, and I think some of the questions in the Q and A, Judith will be answering in her talk. Actually, she has an encyclopedic knowledge of benzo use. So, um, Judith was a family doctor in Birmingham. She worked um, in that space for over thirty years, and she became very interested in working with people who use drugs and alcohol. She retired from clinical work in twenty fifteen. You know, and instead of just taking it easy and after all those years of hard work, she stepped up her work, I'm guessing, continued to work with Birmingham Coroner's Office to monitor drug related deaths and to look for ways to prevent future deaths. Absolutely critical and so much needed. Um, with so, highest rate of drug related deaths, haven't we here? Uh, she is a board member of International Doctors for Healthier Drug Policies uh, and she has supported in a big way, the development of evidence based drug policy here um, locally, nationally and internationally. So thank you very much for coming along, Judith. Thank you very much. Hopefully I'm unmuted. And can you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, yes, I was privileged really to be a GP in Birmingham, as you've heard, for 30 years and, and, and enjoyed the work so much in the, in the inner city community where, where I was based. Um, and benzos, because I'm now 72, as you can perhaps tell, um, benzos have been part of my life, through my life, and particularly my professional life. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a GP's perspective. I'm going to touch on these guidelines and guidances, which um, AJ and, and Joanne Joanna uh, uh, clearly, um, quite rightly say, uh, 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 people, both people who use drugs and people who work with people who use drugs and people who prescribe drugs uh, need to understand better. Um, and uh, but I'm focused at the end really on 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 benzos as part of drug related death, as we've we've already had 
what a lovely, what a fascinating talk from Graham explaining the intricacies of the insides of all our brains. Are wonderful. I like those little pictures of the GABA receptors um, and, and, and the excellent work that, um, that Joanna and AJ have done. So I'll, I'll, I'll crack on. I'm going to talk. Um, oh, dear. No, oh, now, how, how can I crack on? It won't go. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, it just clicks on. There we are. So Valium um, was particularly uh, hit the market in 1963 and immediately became part of popular culture and um, the Rolling Stones. I, I recommend you don't start humming this because it, it's a terrible tune to get out of your head afterwards and I won't burst the song, but they were clearly describing exactly what we've heard that, that um, Valium, as it was in those days, um, is very effective for helping you to get through the day and to calming you down. Um, she goes running for the shelter of her mother's little helper, indeed. And this is the time when benzos were, I think of it uh, like a sign curve. Um, the, when they first appeared, all the GP prescri uh, the, all the prescribers around the world uh, embraced them as, as the answer to treating, helping people who came in with anxiety and with with sleep disorders which uh, many 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 of our patients did and and previously we had barbiturates and people were dying dying um very very easily with overdose of barbiturates and the, and the benzos were were the answer to the problem of the barbiturates so we had a period i i put a little sign curve up there taken from electronicshub.org um to show that when a new medication comes in there's, a, there's almost always a period of time when it's the absolutely best thing since sliced bread. This is going to solve all our problems. It stops anxiety. It's not dependence forming. It's no overdoses. Of course, these things turn out not to be quite true. And then there's a period of time, and we hit that in the 70s and the 80s, when we realise that, that actually there's a big downside and we need to help people actually to stop taking these quite so freely. Um, and this is uh, when I became a GP. In Birmingham, there's our ball from the middle of Birmingham. Um, it was a time at the beginning of the 80s when Margaret Thatcher was there. We had an economic recession, a bit like we've got now, haven't we? And, um, and my patients were dropping out of school. And, and the whole population of Birmingham, when I arrived, appeared to be taking Valium. We were all, they were up there. We, I wasn't at the time. They were all uh, cocooned in a little little bubble um, of, of Valium because the GPs have been prescribing them to answer everybody's problems. Um, and my first 10 years as a GP was spent helping that population of inner city Birmingham uh, to start to learn to live without the benzos. And it was a journey which, which I went on with other colleagues around. I'll touch on, on again how, how we worked out how to do it. So by 1977, just before I became a GP, apparently it was the most frequently prescribed medication worldwide. What a thing. And in, even in the UK, at that time, we had 30 million prescriptions. And Public Health England tell us that, um, that they have slowly reduced the numbers of prescriptions um, um, over the decades since then. But we still have, at the bottom here, 120,000 people thought to be on long-term prescriptions at the moment, or, or five years ago, I suppose that was. Um, so back in the 80s, when I became a GP, we suddenly started to realize that that um that that there was this problem that they did work very well with anxiety and also help people to sleep but there was a problem for many people with dependency and tolerance and withdrawal symptoms and gps were so quite suddenly advised to stop prescribing long term and to only prescribe for three to four weeks and we had that sort of rebound of the sign curve where all the people prescribing thought oh goodness me the government says i've got to stop these long-term prescriptions and everybody was kind of being pushed off them um, and and um, needed needed advice and guidance um, because stopping benzos suddenly can cause fits and can cause seizures and can cause uh, withdrawal symptoms as we were discovering so uh, heather ashton uh, i think joanne joanne uh, and um, and aj mentioned the ashton manual uh, heather ashton i would when we started to have emails back in the beginning of the 90s, it must have been, I don't know, um, I was communicating with Heather Ashton, who was running a benzo withdrawal clinic, supporting the same population that I was, the people who 
the whole ordinary population of Birmingham who were all taking Valium. And, and actually, my, my colleagues who came out of medical school have since told me they had spent 10 years as well helping the population to learn to, 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 to live without them and to be very pleased to get off them in the end, many of them. But Heather Ashton had to add a, a caveat to her original manual. Um, now, I can't say I've got bits of mute things. Oh, there we are. I'm just moving out. I'm sorry. I'm playing with my screen. The rate of tapering should never be rigid. Read that at the bottom. But should be controlled by the patient, not the doctor, according to individual needs, which are different in every case. And the prescribers needed to be told this. And actually, the people who used um, Benzos at the time needed to be told this. And my good old friend, Chris Ford, uh, and these all these other names, some of whom are still in working in the field. Chris Ford and and Fergus Law wrote guidance for the for the use um, of benzos and um, updated it in twenty in this century in twenty fourteen because again we had to explain to the prescribers that some people are not able to detox as they this is a quote from their from their update. Um, because of the symptoms and or may, they may want to continue knowing the risks and prescribers after ensuring informed consent need to support the patient's decision um, and at the very bottom um, the reduction dose should always be flexible and controlled by the doc by the patient not the doctor the decision to and this message even now um, hasn't got through to everybody the and, and the reason this message is, is important is, is A, for safety, but also because this is what works. This is what we know works best. If somebody has control of their own withdrawal and reports their own symptoms and works out for themselves, that's when it will work. Judith, you've muted yourself accidentally too many bits of things on my screen. I'm sorry. Here the psychiatrist and the psychopharmacologist, thank you, um, came in uh, again uh, 10 years ago now and, 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 and pointed out that some people are helped by a longer term prescription. Not most people, but a small percentage of people. Um, I had a, a good old friend, Dr. Patrick Ireland, who, who used to say that some people are born 30 milligrams short of diazepam. And that may not be quite, quite the best way to describe it, but some people have such a wreck of a childhood, for example, where they're hurt and abused in childhood, and it can take decades before they can face, um, face life without, without some sort of medication to, to cotton wool their brains from those bad, bad early starts. But the psychiatrists and the psychopharmacologists have this bit at the bottom of the screen. Um, if treatment courses lasting more than four weeks are required, this should not necessarily be regarded as a deviation from good clinical practice. Those words were so powerful for prescribers. None of us want to be thought to be deviating from good clinical practice. We want to, we want to do what our colleagues think is the right thing to do, and we want to help our patients, really. Um, but they, they gave permission for those people who, who find the withdrawal symptoms very difficult to either accept that the benzos are better than the alternatives or um, at least to, to prolong their, withdraw their, their withdrawal so that the, 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 the symptoms are reduced. So we've touched, we know the benefits, the side effects and the harms. We've already gone through all of this, so I don't need to talk about them, except um, just to mention that in, in elderly people, there's definitely a risk of falls. Um, in my age group, I'd be at risk if I suddenly started taking benzos, which I hope I won't, um, of, of, of fractured hips particularly. Um, but the bottom right you see there, look, no causal link to dementia. There was a time, even a few years ago, when people were saying that uh, because of what they were trying to, what they're trying to work out whether benzos were causing dementia. And um, I'm, this is a paper uh, which a big paper matching, look at that, 40,000 people with dementia and, um, and 200, 290,000, 280,000 people uh, controls. And they overall, their conclusion, and I'm pleased to see this, we know that benzos do have some harms, but causing dementia is not, is not one of them. Uh, and that is, that is good. But the harms are there. We know that they, they cause difficulty forming 
new memories they cause this this retrograde amnesia even for the day before you took the benzos very much like alcohol you can have blackouts which joanna and aj so vividly um had descriptions of from their from their uh, from their study um and um students and young people who are studying should be aware that the benzos may make it actually harder for them to lay down the new memories that they're wanting to acquire um, and, and are to be avoided for that reason. Also, this, this inhibition, some, not everybody's different and people's brains are different, aren't they, Graham? And um, some of my, I, remember, I always remember one of my patients, I'd given her only maybe, I think it was about six low dose um, diazepams to help her through the tail end of a, of a methadone detox. And she stopped, come to the end of the methadone and I'd given her various medications and then a week later she was going to start naltrexone to help her to support her on the way and she was keen to do this but about day two or three her boyfriend brought her in kind of more or less led her in by the ear and said look don't give her any more she's taken them all already don't give her any more of these see she knows what benzos do to her and in her case and it was hilarious well sorry it was seriously a worry but it was quite funny on the day because this 40 year old normally sensible young lady had um had had regressed to the age of about 10 and was 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 clearly um disinhibited and and agitated and definitely the benzos were not the best for her um so through the through the decades we sort of hope that they first of all the best things since sliced bread they're going to solve everybody's problems they don't cause overdose and then let's get everybody off them. And then one kind of hopes that they'll find their level. You know, like when gin first appeared and everybody, there's those Hogarth prints of everybody getting very drunk. And then gradually people realize that you shouldn't take it every day. And, and people have a gin and tonic now and then. And same with kind of coffee, where cafe, coffee first arrived, the population were getting too speedy and high with it and everybody was worried. And then uh, you tend to have a coffee in the morning. We hope that the benzos can find their place, but at the moment we have this problem um, of popular culture still embracing them. Although I think America is now moving away from Xanax. Um, here's, you know, decades after the Rolling Stones um, were singing about Valium, we have Maria Taylor singing about Xanax and, and describing precisely the useful effects in the short term. Of, um, of a bit of uh, a bit of benzo, which can allow you to breathe again and can allow you to sleep again. But um, increasingly we're worried because they're being mentioned as part of course of death. And one of the reasons I'm here today is because as you heard at the beginning, I keep I hold the database for Birmingham for all the drug related deaths. So I know about everybody who's died since 2009. Um, and um, every one of them, um, it's, a, it's a very moving, um, thing to do every two months to go in and, and, and learn about who, who has died. And I'm very, very keen to find ways to prevent future death. So we have saw these graphs a bit with where Graham put them up, the similar graphs. And I, I, I've just used slightly different um, parts of the information. Um, and and the, uh, the um, sorry, I'm moving bits out of my screen again so that I can see the graphs. Um, England and Wales on the left and Scotland on the right. And I put the, uh, the 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 England and Wales. I added the novel their novel benzos together and and put them against the diazepam. So the where diazepam is mentioned as part of the cause of death, you can see that in in the last two since COVID really, <laughs> uh, the novel benzos have appeared in England and Wales. But what happened in Scotland in uh, 2015? Um, their diazepam levels stayed similar. Um, to England, although, of course, their population, as Graham pointed out, is much smaller. Uh, but the artisanam, the street benzos, took off. And but I, I, I would, I, I, and in Scotland, one of the differences is that people who use heroin and people who use uh, cocaine and, and crack are, are, are also using, using the benzos in huge, huge amounts, these, these um, artisanams. And as Graham said, 90% of these deaths where um, the benzos are mentioned, there's an opiate there. And I would suggest that the main cause of death, without the opiate, the person will be unlikely to die. It's very unusual to die with a benzo alone. It, it, it's, it's, um, the respiratory depression that it causes, you, ten, you tend to go to sleep and then wake up a long time later, maybe not remembering. Um, it's very unusual to die without another 
respiratory depressant adding together with it, as we've heard from both the previous two speakers, um, and the alcohol particularly, uh, but even more powerfully, uh, the opiate. So when we talked earlier about um, using flu flumazenil, I can never remember what it's called, which is the antidote to benzos, I would think about four times about that. I, I think here's my nasal naloxone that I carry in my my pocket because it fits in my jeans pocket. I used to carry the big yellow pen, but that had to go in my handbag um, when I walked through town. And I would suggest to all of you that you get hold of some because I wouldn't walk through the city centre um, without it. Um, but I would use that if I found somebody unconscious and that, even if I was told that they're taking a lot of benzos because um, almost always, as we say, as, as we saw in the Scottish figures, the opioid is there as well. And if you take the opioid out, and I dial trouble nine first. Uh, hopefully the ambulance will be there in time to, uh, to, to support them and to give them more, more naloxone. Uh, and if they need it, to give the flu mazenil. Because as we said earlier, um, with swift, sudden withdrawal from, from benzos can cause withdrawal fits. In the same way as suddenly stopping alcohol when you've got a big dependency can cause withdrawal fits. And, uh, and I wouldn't want to be responsible for that. So, um, going on, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is a very sad slide. This is seven young men um, who've died in Birmingham in the last um, 18 months. And this is the benzos that I, I extract. I took out these, these seven young men because they'd all taken these fancy street designer benzos, um, mentioned as part of the cause of death on the death certificate. But I would suggest to you it's the opioid, it, the main cause of death on the left. It's the opioid that they've taken, which has stopped them breathing. And the benzos has just kept them, kept them asleep while, while, while they were going through it, I'm afraid. Very, very sad. And there's some pregabalin in there as well, as you'll see. Uh, but there's oxycodone and tramadol. These uh, number four, five and, and, and seven, um, very, very young men um, had, had thought they'd bought oxycodone, all three of them. And, and, I've, and there are other young people, teenagers, 18, 19 year olds around the country. I've spoken to some of their families who bought oxycodone, they thought, online. And it turns out to be this new nitazine, these designer opioids, another unintended consequence of the war on drugs and of prohibition and very, very frightening. Um, <clears throat> and the, these three chaps thought they were taking an oxycodone pill and a, and a, and a trendy benzo. They probably had ordered Xanax. Um, and instead they instead they very sadly died and i'm sorry um, so how do we reduce these harms we've we have we have touched on some of this um, we've we've mentioned wedding or graham mentioned wedding us um, where anybody around the uk can send send pills and 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 and, and like graham i i'll show you on my next slide i do keep an eye on wedding us um, and um, i've now switched my video off goodness knows um, never mind, you don't need to see me. Uh, Mandrake in Manchester are doing similar thing uh, and the loop. The loop, the loop who, who go to some, in the UK, we are not testing nearly enough. Let me put, try and get my, where's my camera gone? Um, hopefully is that on again now? Uh, start video, sorry, it had moved itself around the place. Oh dear, there we are, I'm back. Um, the Loop, I was lucky enough to work as a harm reductionist on one of, uh, on a festival they came to Birmingham. We don't do nearly enough drug testing in the UK. In, in Europe, many countries in Europe, the government contributes to drug testing and people can take their pills and powders before they go clubbing or, or to the festival or whatever, or on the street, street and get it tested. Um, but The Loop do an amazing job. And if you don't know about them, have a look at their website. And I went to this festival, which was a drum and bass techno and garage festival in Birmingham, <laughs> um, where I think garage is, is that supposed to be? I don't know what garage is really, but I had little lessons on these before I went on the day. And it was extraordinary that little young clubbers, 18, 19 year olds came in with glitter on their faces and put pills and powders in to be tested into, into little bags and um, sent, them, sent them into this, into the chemists who were sitting in the porter cabin at the back. On the other side of our police and crime commissioner who was who was watching what was going on um, and then they came back half an hour later and spoke to me using fiona misham's very academic protocols to learn what they thought about drugs what they'd tried before they'd never these people i spoke to had never spoken to any professional person before about their drug use they'd only spoke to their peers um, 
and uh, they were all fascinating to me. I learned a lot from them, and they hopefully learned some stuff from me. So the, the bottom, but at the bottom, and we need an awful lot more because it does help, although it's not by any manner of means the main answer. So the EMCDDA, um, sadly, look at the bottom there. We we worked along with Lisbon to 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 monitor all the drugs coming into Europe and 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 the UN as well. We're contributing to it all from Brexit. It's an unintended consequence of Brexit from from January 2021. We're no longer. We no longer, they no longer share. And their latest um, report, you'll see, doesn't have the UK in there. Well, it's maybe that's, we quite like that because it used to be, you know, all the rest of the European countries and then UK because our drug related deaths, very sadly, are highest in Europe and Scotland's, as you've seen, are higher even than that. Um, but we've lost at the moment anyway. I don't know whether anything will change from that. So I also went on to Wedinos on your behalf. <laughs> and looked at two weeks in the um, in, in beginning of February. Um, and I found the on the left, the diazepam, 88 examples just in two weeks of diazepam. And one of them, you'll see, has this thylazine. I had to look that up because I actually didn't know what it was. Uh, Graham probably would know. But it's a, a strong sedative um, tranquilizer used for cows and horses, and it has been linked to deaths in, in, um, in the US. And there's two samples people had sent in from the UK thinking they bought diazepam. And they've got bromazolam plus xylazine, which a combination which could kill you. And then, but even more worryingly on the right, look at that, 31 samples of alprazolam. And these two, two pills, people thought they bought Xanax and they've got metanitazine and protonitazine, which are these deadly, terribly deadly, um, potent opioids, 20 times stronger than fentanyl or something, which is already 20 times stronger than heroin or is it 10? I forget. But they could certainly definitely kill a young person who bought those, uh, who thought they got Xanax and took those by mistake. And I'm very sorry to see those there. Um, and this is just what you see if you go on the wedding or site on the right, there's the, 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 there's the one at the top, which is Widner's. Oh, I'm getting things in the way again. Um, uh, that was the Aprazolam, that's right, which turned out to be as you can see, protonitazine, and the bottom one, which is somebody in Edinburgh uh, who thought they bought an oxycodone pill, and it turned out to, again to be protonitazine, um, a, a product of prohibition. And on the left, we've got um, Mandrake showing us that four MDMA identical looking pills can contain the one on the right with the caffeine, that's about one cup of coffee, um, which might perk you up a bit, but wouldn't uh, give you the empathy that you're looking for. So, oh, um, I don't know how to go back now because uh, there we are. This is, uh, Graham showed us this earlier and what a privilege to have somebody who's on the advisory council on misuse of drugs in the UK um, explaining these things to us. We can do our testing. We can put things in lists like this and Graham showed us the same list with his highlights on it earlier. We can put them into class C and schedule one and things. Does that make them any safer? Does that really reduce the harms? I know that the ACMD do a lot of work on this and I'm grateful to them because at least we know a bit more what we're dealing with, but it doesn't, it doesn't address the harms. So what should we be doing? I'm coming towards the end here. Careful legal regulation of all drugs, I believe, is, should be our next steps. Kofi Annan said, and he, for young people listening, he was, he was the um, Secretary General of the United Nations, head of the United Nations, uh, for many years before he, he, he when after he left that, he joined the Global Commission on Drug Policy. And this is the, the report, the last report that he wrote 2018 before he died. And he said, I believe that drugs have destroyed many lives, but wrong government policies have destroyed many more. And I do believe that what we're doing is not right and we could do better. We could we could stop doing things which don't work. So the Global Commission, I would recommend you have a look at this. It's not a hard read. It's, I mean, it's a bit, little bit long, but it's quite simple. It's just describing how we could have responsible control of drugs all over the world, countries where they're produced and countries where they're, where they're used. And I would also look at the Transform Drugs site, site which is a, a UK-based um, group of people, charity <laughs> based in Bristol, uh, and read there after the war on drugs blueprint for regulation. Where would you put the benzos? Here's the five different places you might put people in a, in a regulated system. I wouldn't put them on the right here. I wouldn't put them in the cafes where people are drinking coca tea and coffee. 
I wouldn't even put them in the uh, licensed premises like the um, cannabis coffee shops in the, in Holland. Um, and I wouldn't even give them to the re licensed retailers who might be like the cannabis shops you've got in can Canada and across most of the, the US now. I would put benzos if I was setting up this new system next week uh, with the specialist pharmacists and I'd get them to give proper harm reduction advice if somebody chooses to use benzos and they're not getting a prescription from a doctor and advice from a doctor if they choose to use them uh, for other reasons then they should have advice they should have the dose they should have the ingredients on the packet and they should be explained to them that if you take them for more than three or four weeks you can become dependent three or four weeks it doesn't take long to get a dependence and that dependence uh, for some people uh, can last for months or even or even uh, occasionally years um, the the good news about the dependence i suppose is that um 60 percent 60 percent of people can have have no withdrawal symptoms and can safely withdraw from benders even after fairly long use of them um, but there is a proportion of people, a much smaller proportion, um, who have a lot of difficulty and need a lot of help. So they need harm reduction advice. They need to know what they're taking. They need to know the strength of it, along with if they want to buy MDMA. We have, you know, like a million and a half people or something using cocaine in the UK and half a million people regularly taking MDMA to feel empathetic and to enjoy a warm feeling while they're listening to music they should go to these specialist pharmacists in my opinion and know what they're taking and have advice on it um, so there we are I've finished this is my last slide three ways to save taxpayers money and prevent i hope future deaths in week one move drug policy from the home office who don't understand it to the department of health i heard a labor mp saying that i thought that was a good idea down in brighton um uh, a couple of weeks ago at the conference um week two decriminalize possession of all drugs for personal use well you know i have been saying this for years but now people are agreeing aren't they that uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, making um a person who uses drugs criminalizing the fact that they're holding the heroin in the hand or the cocaine or the mdma um, only increases the harm that drug might do to them. It certainly doesn't reduce the harm. And many other countries have done this around the world. And the sky has not fallen in on them, and they've seen benefits. Week three, work towards that careful, strict regulation, learning from mistakes that other countries might have made. So stop wasting money doing things which don't work. 30, 40,000 pounds a year to put somebody in prison for no good effect. Stop causing harm to people. And... Um, and I hope prevent future deaths. Thank you. Brilliant stuff, Judith. Thank you so much for all that. There's a lot, a lot there. And for your, you know, unceasing work on this, it's just absolutely brilliant. And it's great to get the medical perspective. Um, so, you know, how well have we done today? We've had, um, you know, the, the, the project uh, with all that information uh, from users. GP's perspective, pharmacologist, so all that amazing expertise. There are quite a lot of questions. Um, and it's interesting about the pharmacist. Yes, benzos being available in the pharmacy, that makes so much sense to me as well. Um, and it, you know- Not, not, not any pharmacy, particularly no, no pharmacies that have got the expertise yeah. that are yes. separate from, yeah. not your ordinary street, street pharmacy because they don't have the time they need yeah. people who've got who, who 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 are able to spend the time to give the information <laughs> yeah and of course the uk is the college of mental health pharmacists association you know that's that's a really some brilliant brilliant people um who are also, also part of drug science um on that and it always amazes me how little people use their local pharmacist actually for advice on on drugs on anything they're buying you know uh, but as you say the specialist pharmacists of course so something that lots of people judith have been asking about and graham i don't know if you want to comment is coming off benzos um how to how to come off them safely and in that context the psychologist is asking at what point of that coming off process do you think somebody can then engage in therapy um, <laughs> to support them? And of course, this is a tricky one to add. There's no one size fits all, is there? Um, but your sort of thoughts would be great. Yes, this, this is, um, thank you to the um, therapy question. Um, this is, this is uh, a, a long discussion that, that's gone on for decades. 
Um, I believe that that um, that that people who use drugs, whatever drugs they are, can benefit from psychological therapies, even while they are living with drugs, even while they are using drugs. Of any of us, even you know, all of us can benefit, can't we, from some cognitive behavior therapy, from some sensible advice from a psychologist, even if we are not actually living a drug-free life, even if we are still struggling with our with our ability to get our self-motivation and our self-esteem up high enough to, to, to deal with an actual detox. So I would suggest start at the very beginning with psychological therapies. Dependency um, can, can develop, as we've said, after, after only three or four weeks, apparently, although for many people it can take, it comes on gradually and, 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 and can take um, people, people who've taken, um, have been prescribed. There are studies which show that people have been prescribed diazepam for you know, a year or two years or three years, a large proportion of them don't have any withdrawal symptoms when they stop and they haven't developed tolerance to them. And they can just, you wouldn't stop them suddenly because of that withdrawal um, risk of fits, but they can they can tail them off over six, four or six weeks and not have any problem. But the proportion of people who, who do have problems, um, Heather Ashton's wonderful manual actually is addressed firmly at the person who uses or is prescribed or is using the benzos. And I would recommend that people who feel they're getting into a difficulty read it um, because there's very sensible advice there on how to make your own tapering uh, path with benzos and to, and, to, and, to, and to wean yourself off them at whatever level you feel able to I, I as I said I I spent 10 years my first 10 years as a GP helping people through through this um this reduction uh, process and I, I vividly remember one lady coming in um after she'd stopped the benzos. she was keen to come off them because she realized that she'd become she started to feel dependent on them um and she came in a couple of months later and I said how are you feeling and she said it's wonderful I can feel the wind blowing in my hair again Oh, and wow. I've never forgotten it. And that um, cotton wool bubble feeling that benzos give you may be nice in the short term. And it might help you come down from a from a cocaine binge or something. Um, but it most of us neither need nor want to be walking about in that cut off slight haze uh, all the time. So people can can be supported to come off. People can work out their own ways to come off. And psychological therapies should be there from the start, yeah. because if you were taking the benzos to help you with anxiety symptoms, you need other ways to deal with those, and phobias and harms from childhood and all the rest of it yeah. from the very beginning, even if you are still being affected by taking drugs, that's my opinion. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. And of course we need government to um, invest in psychological support. It's so well, much needed, isn't it? Especially for young people. Where yeah. Such long waiting lists, it's horrific. Um, um Joe, yeah, can so, I just slightly so disagree then. with Judith? Oh, we got it. I don't know, right. Graham. <laughs> um, my recommendation to everyone is always if you want to come off any drug, but I mean, alcohol or benzodiazepines, the best thing to do is to contact your local drug service who will give you um, friendly advice. Um, maybe not all GPs are up to um, um, the task, but your local drug service will should give people uh, good advice. It's better to do that than just start tapering yourself and picking a dose. Yes. Okay. Reduction. That's not a disagreement. I would reckon definitely agree with you. You're yeah. just you're 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 adding. Um, there are GPs who specialise in working with people who use drugs and alcohol, and that's a very good place to go if, if, if your GP surgery happens to have somebody like that. Um, but also, as you quite rightly say, uh, there are um, the, 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 all every area has their own their own drug treatment service and everybody has access to that and can get sensible advice and support and the psychological services that you need to, to surround you while you're doing it. Um, and uh, I. I but as, a, as an individual person, many people with and there are self-help groups and I don't you don't always have to involve a professional person. Um, you, you, there are self-help groups online. There are groups where people support each other. And if you read, if you're an intelligent young person, you can read the manuals, you can work out for yourself and you can start that way. But 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 certainly if you feel able to 
and I would encourage that and drug treatment services should be accessible and open and friendly and welcoming but they tend people tend to be frightened of going to them they're, they're, they're thought of as places where uh, you can only go if you're using heroin which is of course not true um, but many people the stigma of, of using drugs is strong isn't it and if you have a GP with a special interest that's a very good safe place to go yeah so stupid question can you just walk into the alcohol drug services you can you barrel? should be yes no no um what's the thing a phrase about every open door or something you yeah. should be able to go in to any you can ring them up they're 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 available online you can you can uh, walk in uh, and ask for help um i suppose the first place will be to to ring them up ideally and the, the every every drug service around the country has a has a phone number and you'll be directed to come in and you can sit down and talk with a key worker talk with a with a medic if you need that but but mainly get the support and advice and encouragement really because yeah. you know, if you find you've got a problem nobody wants to have this kind of problem if you find you've become dependent um on something the best thing is to avoid the dependence by and i agree with joanne and and, and uh, joanna and aj we need this harm reduction advice out there for people to understand yeah that they are habit forming yeah. that those are habit forming do not use them every day. Do not drift yourself into into that. It's it's like you know smoking cigarettes. Do <laughs> do not uh, try one. You know, I suppose as a young adult, to see what a cigarette is like. But do not allow yourself to get hooked because it's such a palaver, isn't it? When you after you become dependent on something, extracting yourself from it. So the reduction in prescribing, actually, the prescribing figures way back when were massive, weren't they? I was shocked to see that actually just incredible. But how, so so the advice to reduce prescribing and for much shorter periods of time. So has that correlated with an increase in illicit drug use then, benzo use? Uh, yes. Why have we got, I mean, that graph, that stark graph in Scotland is astonishing, isn't it? Uh, why have we got the increased use it some of it as 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 Joanna and AJ Joanna and AJ said is driven by culture by social norms by people people thinking this is cool and they need the harm reduction advice to say well you know it's benzos actually are relatively compared with some other drugs like like you know strong opiates um relatively um not so dangerous but if there are ways to take them to make them avoid them causing you harm um, and cutting down the prescribing uh, yeah. has made them less available. Um, there are there are some sensible people calling for it. Once somebody has developed a dependency, maybe to street drugs, they should we should now have more prescribing of um, of um, of diazepam, particularly uh, to help people who want to come away from the street drugs, and then when they're ready to to help them to taper off the. Um, yeah. the benzos all together and get on with their lives so yeah. you talked about um the emotional blunting actually mm -hmm. which would be as unhelpful in life in general but for bereavement uh i think you have elaborated a bit on that you know that example of the woman feeling the wind in her hair um but do you want to add anything to that um certainly ben benzos some people do take them in in times of bereavement they're, but they're but they're not um they're not found helpful and they're not good for post-traumatic stress and these things because our brains need to sadly with support hopefully and help from friends and family and others we need to get through these periods of time without this fuzzy cop molly effect um benzos can be useful for short periods for sudden things for 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 occasional occasional use um but uh, but are not a good um but 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 uh, definitely there are things when you will want to be clear-headed aren't there when you want to be able to concentrate and focus and in families certainly back in the 80s when everybody seemed to be they were all taking tenuate dospan and um for, for 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 weight loss which actually is like an amphetamine and um they were all taking amphetamines for their spring cleaning <laughs> how can i get on with the cleaning without some i'm very glad that i never tried amphetamines actually in my life i still haven't so far <laughs> because i think i would have had trouble getting on with my spring cleaning without them. Yes, me too. it's hard <laughs> enough anyway 
I can see, yeah, I can see that they probably would have helped in the short term, although they also have dependency problems. Um, but that fogging of the of the of the benzos within families was horrible, actually. Yeah. And it was lovely to see people uh, coming off them and young people. It, there's no difference. The the street benzos that we're seeing structurally, as we've seen from Graham's talk, are very similar to the ones that we're prescribing. Almost luckily, I suppose, in the sense they don't have enormous more side effects, although the doses may be, may be smaller that you need to take um, for the same effect. But they're very similar to the, to the prescribed benzos. Sorry, I lost track there slightly. Just so uh, we are, I'm aware that we're pretty much out of time. This has been the most brilliant session. And actually going into the chat, there is there are masses of resources. Um, Mags is has been amazing at sorting all the chat and, and Graham's answering the questions online and she's put all those in the chat. Mags, I hope uh, you can keep up track of all this because they're coming in thick and fast, which is brilliant. Thank you so much to the audience for such brilliant engagement and for all your help. Um, there's a really nice, um, and actually people aren't leaving. Normally people start to, I mean, people are, but not many. Um, this has been brilliant. So I thought this was an interesting question. Hannah is wondering whether there's a link between the, the agitation and the disinhibition effects that you talked about, which I hadn't heard about before, and people having a diagnosis of ADHD. It's mm. an interesting question, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. Um, and this is where we need the neuropharmacologist people again, because, well, number one, everybody is different. Uh, uh, patient People with ADHD, uh, people growing up with ADHD in the past, certainly in some of my patients, um, definitely I can remember, um, tried amphetamines along with their peer group at the time and found this uh, paradoxical relaxation with amphetamines and, and ADHD. And of course, Ritalin and the prescriptions that people get to treat their ADHD are a form of uh, stimulant and for, for you and me. So somebody with ADHD can, can actually be feel, feel relaxed with the stimulant. Um, and I don't know, I don't know. It must be that something in these GABA receptors that Graham showed us pictures of, <laughs> um, some people's genetic structure, and I'm sure it's it's something different to the way that some people's brains work uh, one yeah. thing does has one effect for one person yeah somebody may have a slightly different chemical yeah, yeah. and actually i see a uh, mags putting in the next event at manchester uni will be psychedelics for trauma and we've talked quite a lot of, about trauma in this so that uh it will be recorded mags i think um the audio recording anyway, but if you're in Manchester, it's next Wednesday. There's a couple of psychedelics events. I'll just do a shameless plug here. Um, Wednesday afternoon, so that's next Wednesday the 15th, we'll be having an expert discussion panel um, and talks on psychedelics for use in people with cancer, um, with um, depression and anxiety associated with the illness and the diagnosis. And then in the evening, we'll be talking about psychedelics for PTSD. So that's a shameless plug. Um, so I thought I had another question, but I don't think. Uh, OK, no, I don't think there's anything much else. So just then to remind the audience that if your colleagues and friends were not able to come to this, it's all recorded, so you'll be able to see all the slides, all the speakers. Um, it'll be on James Morgan's YouTube channel, which is great if you haven't already been there, and on the Drug Science website, so it's very easily available. Um, and that'll probably come out in about two weeks or so, two or three weeks. Drug Science are very busy at the moment. Um, so really all I need to do now is to say a massive thank you to all our speakers for taking so much time and answering all the questions and giving such brilliant loads of thank yous coming in um so many people um you know engaging with this there's clearly need for more information more education policy change and that's going to happen i think as a result of of your your brilliant um work and this um, and all the people who are helping us. So thank you very much. 
Another shameless plug for the next Street Drugs webinar, which will be on naloxone. And Judith has shown us her naloxone, so that's a good start for that on May the 19th. Uh, so we will have um, Danny Ahmed's coming to talk at that. We have a, um, a serving police officer telling us how they're rolling. That's Thames Valley, how they're rolling that out. Um, and a couple of other. Oh, Ross Gittins is coming to talk on that. She's a mental health pharmacist and humankind. I saw that coming uh, in the chat. Um, it's a fantastic organization. Um, and Meg, who was at the Cranston event last week. Um, so these are they are experts in, in the use of naloxone and then the need for it. So um, on that happy note, everybody, I'll say um, cheerio. Thank and thank you all again and see you at the next one, everybody.